Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for Manufacturing Back in Action, hosted by the Michigan Manufacturers Association and Red Level. My name is Delaney McKinley, and I am Vice President of Membership Marketing and Events at MMA. I'd like to thank you all for being here today, and I should first mention that this video discussion is being recorded. We also hope that it's going to be fairly conversational, so you have an opportunity to present our speakers with your questions, and you'll enter those in the Q&A panel when we get to that portion of the event. Um, I'd also like to thank my co-host, Red Level, for making this morning's peer-to-peer -peer discussion possible. As Michigan's leading technology services partner for small to medium-sized businesses, Red Level is helping manufacturers get back to work safely and in compliance with Governor Whitmer's orders through the COVID ClearPass app. With ClearPass, your workforce has access to mission-critical tools right on their phone. You can screen for COVID symptoms, you can queue location access, and share key information all from one central platform. It is my pleasure to introduce David King, President and CEO of Red Level, who will be your moderator today. David, I was on your website earlier today, and I really love how your team shares bios on there, so I, I thought I'd follow that model today. So it's very succinct, it's descriptive, and it gets right to the point. So David King, he's a Navy veteran, Wayne State grad, father, hunter, IT leader. David, the floor is yours to introduce our global manufacturing leaders and start the discussion. Well, th thank you, Delaney. And again, thank you for the Michigan Manufacturers Association and the sponsorship of this webinar. Uh, as Delaney mentioned, I'm David King, President and CEO of Red Level. Uh, we're a technology firm based in Michigan with an office just outside of Detroit and another office in Grand Rapids. And we specialize in IT services and helping a lot of manufacturers throughout the state. And actually uh, uh, over 50% of our business comes from the manufacturing industry. So we're very excited to support the MMA and its efforts, especially for those, uh, of, those of us as, as we're starting to plan our methods of getting back to work. So very excited to be here today and to kind of host this webinar. And we've got some exciting uh, speakers on the panel today, which I'm very happy to be a part of. And I think we're gonna to come to you with a large company uh, perspective as well as a small company's perspective. So we're gonna give you uh, to share some stories with our panelists and gonna go over lots of great information today. Uh, I think our, our discussion today is, is planning to go around 40 to 45 minutes uh, with the panelists and Delaney's gonna help because one of our panelists uh, had a medical um, illness late last night. Um, so she's gonna come in and kind of share some of the perspective of the MMA and what the MMA is also doing uh, to help businesses get back to work. So we're going to be able to pepper all that together. Uh, but we are going to leave time at the end of this for conversation questions. So you will see at the uh, right side, I believe, of your screen, you have the ability to add questions. So please add questions as we go along, but we're going to leave enough time at the end of this to be able to answer your questions. And if we run out of time, we will we'll certainly summarize those responses and fo do a follow-up after that. So with that, I'd like to introduce our two uh, panelists today as well, along with Delaney. Uh, we've got Jennifer Zabigan. Uh, Jennifer is the Vice President of Human Resources and Marketing at Aludine, a uh, position she's held since 2019. In this position, she's responsible for driving talent strategy, leading culture change, and championing the corporate brand. She holds over 20 years of experience in HR and spent time at ZF, TRW, and most recently with American Axel as a Director of Global Human Resources for the Driveline Division. Throughout her career, she's helped shape collaborative organization structures and build an engaged workforce to maximize uh, business performance. Jen Jennifer holds a bachelor's degree from, uh, and master's degree from The Ohio State. So for us Michigan fans, we will give her a pass for today. All right, and also, uh, a little bit about Aludine. Uh, most of you are familiar with Aludine, but it's a large global lightweight uh, solution manufacturer uh, supplying the mobility industry. Aludine manufactures aluminum and iron vehicle components for safety, critical applications, including chassis, subframe, and electric vehicles. The company and its people are committed to lightweight, light weighting and its ability to enable vehicles that improve fuel economy, reduce emissions, and help lower carbon footprints around the world. Aludine had 2,000 sales of $1 billion and operates 22 facilities, four technical centers in nine countries, with employing about 4,000 people in total. So thank you. Uh, our next panelist is Andrew Hayes, and Andrew is the Vice President of Fast, uh, Franklin Fasteners right here in Michigan. Uh, he's the Vice President and Treasurer of Franklin Fasteners and represents the third generation of his family business. 
Andrew is responsible for the company's day-to-day -day production, IT, HR, and finance. He oversees the outside sales development of his team. And prior to work, working with Franklin, he was a project engineer at Hayes Machine, Hayes Machine Company. He was responsible for the service and spare parts department. Andrews received his Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration with an emphasis on accounting and engineering management at Michigan Tech. Thank you, Andrew. A little bit about Franklin. So Franklin is an innovative manufacturer of clamping solutions and precision formed metal components that supplies the military, aerospace and heavy truck and automobile industries. Established in 1953, Franklin Fasteners focuses on creative solutions having seven new patents in the last five years. In addition to our custom clamping component, Franklin has a catalog of standard clamps for many applications, including many industry certifications and its commitment to exceptional quality. So thank you, Andrew, for being a part of the panel today. Uh, Cecilia uh, was another uh, another member of the panelists, but we uh, we appreciate her uh, interest and uh, ability to attend. But again, Cecilia will not be joining us today from Kiker. OK, so thank you for that. Um, so as we get started back in this, I think I think what's unique is that we've got uh, Eludine, which is a large global manufacturer, and we have Franklin Fastener, a local Michigan supplier of manufacturer as well, with about 50 employees or less. So again, great perspective on the sizes of organizations and what they did to prepare. So as we get started uh, with this, Jennifer, how about if we start with you? And uh, again, you, you went through kind of a global uh, bringing back of employees, but kind of a preparation um, preparation for that. So uh, maybe share with us how your pers your perspective on how you started and how you got um, back with the facilities all over the world. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, we have facilities in China, so we had firsthand experience when all this started to happen in China um, on the impact it was going to have. And I can tell you with what was happening in China, Everybody thought it would just stay in China, that we wouldn't have to deal with it outside. Um, so we are learning, feeling bad for our employees that were um, on lockdown from the government, you know, not able to go out and, you know, go to restaurants, go to sporting events. Um, they were all at home. And here we are, you know, in, in Germany, um, you know, Europe, uh, over in the U.S., thinking oh, it's not going to happen to us. It's not going to happen to us. Um, we were wrong, <laughs> very wrong. Um, and as it started to, the virus started to make its way around the world, uh, we had to take a step back and really look at what happened in China, uh, learn from them to determine what they did, did well. Um, so we did a lot of conversations with our Chinese colleagues to understand how they, they helped contain it, um, helped understand who had it, helped make sure that the people, when they came back to work, were safe. Our Chinese operations came back up a lot faster than our operations in Europe or in the U.S., Mexico or in Brazil, uh, but we did do a lot of learning from them as far as how to do the social distancing, how to communicate with the employees, how to educate them. Um, but again, through this time, there was a lot of educating us, our leadership, so that we could teach our employees and educate them, um, keeping the rumors out of the way and, and focusing on the facts. Jennifer, share with us uh, some of the policies that you started to put in place as you were bringing employees back and, and things that you did, because you actually had a, a period of shutdown and then you had a period to kind of get, get prepared. Is that is that correct? Right, right. So we wanted to start with, we have to make sure we have a good educational plan in place for how to teach people how their new reality is going to be. Coming back to work is not going to be the same as what it was when they left. So coming back to work, having screening that had to take place, you know, their temperature being taken, them being asked health questions um, when they come in, they had to be prepared for that because it's not something we ever used to do in the past at any of our locations, but it's our new reality now. So educating them before they came back, um, coming in with ways, how do we make sure that we have um, traffic patterns uh, identified within locations? We got it down to even having drive-through testing. So people had to enter in parking lots in one way, uh, exit through another way. Um, when they came in for time clocks, you know, they used to have multiple places they could enter a plant. Under the new, we had one low area where they could enter. And you have to think of the elements. So is it going to rain on that day that we have people waiting to, to get their screenings done? So um, putting up tents, uh, ways to make sure that our employees could stay, you know, 
covered while they're making their way into the plant. Um, and then things such as changing schedules, changing shifts, so you have less people in a plant at the same time, putting up engineering controls such as plexiglass dividers between operations where needed, um, making employees wear masks out on the production floor, which is not a very well received thing, but again, it's to keep people safe. Um, people don't like the masks, they find them hot, um, not as comfortable, but again, the, the reason behind it and, and having to continue to educate our employees as to the reason behind it is to keep them safe. It's our ultimate goal through everything we've been putting into place. Absolutely. I'm sure safety was, was top of mind as you put all of your policies in place. Did you bring, what type of tools or technology did you bring into place as you started to, to do your planning? And then uh, how did you communicate these changes with your employees as far as, as, far as part of the prep? So, um, we started to rely on some other um, electronic communication tools than we ever had before. You know, company was one that most of our meetings would take place face to face. Now you're all working remotely. So we relied a lot more on technology as far as doing, you know, teams meetings was a big one. Um, our, our senior leadership team would meet every single morning um, to talk about what was happening in the company. We had global leadership meetings once a week to share what was happening in the different regions of the world. And then within our headquarters, um, our salaried workforce, we had meetings with them every single week as well via WebEx. Um, and then for our employees who were out on, on furlough, on layoff while the plants were shut down, we went very low tech in our communications with them and actually created newsletters that we mailed out to the homes. So the, not only the employee, but their family um, could find out you know, when we were planning on reopening, but we also use these newsletters to, to teach our employees about the various government programs that were available to them um, and you know facts and figures through the CDC on coronavirus again to help decrease the negative or the inaccurate information that was so prevalent out there but to really hopefully share accurate sources with our employees and their families so that they could keep up to date with again accurate information. It, it sounds like it was a constant communication challenge to uh, to continue to communicate with employees, their families, and and even inventing new methods along the way that you hadn't done before. Yeah, my normal day went from you know certain number of conference calls to I had almost five hours a day on conference calls, just keeping people up to date on what was happening, which was a big change for me. <laughs> I, I can uh, I can only imagine. So so Andrew Andrew Hayes, the vice president of Franklin, um, he. His story is a little bit different that uh, they he was a critical business and really never shut down. So, Andrew, how about sharing with us? You really didn't have a lot of time to prep. You just did it on, on the fly, if you will. And so tell us about how you started to prepare, maybe even before things started changing. But to kind of share your story here. Yes, we because we're a critical manufacturer, we stayed open the entire time and we're designated that by our main customers on the parts we supply to transportation industry to keep you know semis and other equipment moving but what we had to do is really these guidelines were changing daily from the governor the cdc and the county on what our requirements were it did settle down after about two weeks and it was pretty consistent but the first you know, from the beginning of March until I would say like the 23rd of March, the first two and a half weeks of March was very chaotic on a daily basis, understanding what are we supposed to be doing? A lot of employees nervous, are we gonna be shut down? What's gonna happen? We, we sorted that out and, you know, and we really relied on CDC guidance before there was any, you know, state or local guidance on anything to keep our employees safe that was you know the big question a lot of fear the prior to this happening i was in europe um, on business and pleasure and was seeing on the news there what was going on in italy in late february and you know in seeing that made some decisions that we needed to start ordering pp ppe hand sanitizer and start formulating some kind of plan on how we're going to do this and what's going to happen because it was it was on its way to the United States. It was just a matter of, in, in this case, it was only a matter of several weeks and it was full-fledged in the United States with government lockdowns and stay-at-home orders and all that. So we really started that. We had people that were furloughed because of, you know, order volume reducing dramatically. 
they were out, we we boiled it down to a bare minimum number of people in the facility that it took to sustain the orders and the volume that we had. And we started doing risk assessment to understand where our potential hazards were, looking at interim guidance that was issued by um, you know, OSHA and my OSHA on things that need to be done in conjunction with CDC to start understanding what did we need to do internally. We People wore face masks that started in um, the beginning, in middle of March, we mandatory on face masks and procured those. And then we started looking at engineering controls and look at our office. We sent people home to work remotely, um, continued you know, going through our whole facility. And fortunate for us, what worked out is all of our equipment is spaced you know, 10 to 15 feet apart. So we don't really have a lot of very tight working spaces and operators and personnel can maintain social distancing. And it, from that perspective, it made it a lot simpler where we had a reduced headcount and we had social distancing kind of engineered into our process. So it, it did make it fairly easy for us to do that. Some people are not as fortunate because their situation doesn't warrant that. So we didn't have to do a lot of engineering controls. It was mainly policies of mask and social distancing and getting people moving on that and continuing with that. And the mask policy is the most difficult thing and it's a daily constant enforcement. It's just a daily reminder for people every day. It's very, it's it's frustrating for everybody, but we all have to do it or it's not gonna work and we can't be safe. It, it seems that's a universal sentiment uh, for for us and for general public that, you know, it's, a, it's an adjustment in the mask for the mask as well. How about Delaney, how about the MMA? How did you guys adjust to um, the prep? Were, were you shut down at all or did you continue to operate just remotely or how did you guys operate uh, yourselves? Sure, yeah, uh, we have a staff of a little over 20 people and we never shut down. We continued to operate remotely and we still are, I would say probably 60%, 30% um, split on you know the, the smaller portion working here in the office, some who, who are unable to perform their jobs remotely and um, but but the vast majority are still working remotely and, and we actually found that our workforce was even more productive. Um, we uh, we felt that our the, the services that we provide to our members were more important than ever. We had to get information out to our members you know as as Andrew mentioned, um, regulations were changing by the day. And sometimes by the hour, sometimes there would be uh, there would be numerous executive orders issued the same day. They were being issued at the the federal level, the state level, the local level. We're having counties issue um, workplace requirements. So we felt it was really critical to get information out to our members and try to cut through the noise for them um, because you know the twenty four seven. Uh, news cycle, there was no shortage of information out there. I don't think anybody was left in the dark. The problem was more that it was overwhelming how much information was out there. So we were trying to put forward very credible information, very direct, very succinct, so our members knew what they needed to do and when they needed to do it. Okay. So, great. Thank you for that. And um, so, you know, adjusting is, is a big deal for employees. Uh, we have to adjust daily as, as we all are. But how, um, Jennifer, how have things gone with the employees since returning? Are they pretty open to the changes that are coming out? Um, sometimes people, they, they all say they want change, but they, they really, um, they may resist that. But in this case, you know, some of these things are well beyond anyone's control. But how, how are they embracing that? Uh, are you, have you had trouble or have you had to do uh, anything to kind of incent them or to do anything that you would, you'd like to share in regards? I think that the people coming back, they, when they were first coming back, they were just nervous. You know, what did we put into place? You're telling us what you've done, but until they come back and they see the engineering controls, they see the PPE, you know, they see the social distancing and how it works at the workplace, I think they were nervous. Um, but we actually did a survey with our employees afterwards to say, do you feel safe to be at work? Do you feel like the company took it safely? Do you feel like we took the right steps? The survey was overwhelmingly positive. So, you know, we are getting some anecdotal feedback that, you know, employees feel we've done the right things, but you're doing the survey where it's anonymous, I think is even better to get that. We asked for comments in the survey and the biggest comment we got was around the masks. <laughs> so again, you know, masks are just not very popular. 
Um, we are in some areas giving people the option if they can wear a, a face shield as opposed to a face mask to help, uh, you know, g give them that option um, and still be able to keep, you know, our employees safe. Um, but uh, yeah, overwhelmingly positive um, once they've been back here. There are people that are still nervous, you know, still having um, some of our office workers that are still working remotely. Um, and for those that have, you know, their own health conditions or live with somebody with a health condition, they are more um, concerned about returning to the workplace. And I just keep telling them, if you can do your job from home remotely and still able to do it, then then do it. I'd rather have you be safe, keep your family safe, um, be productive at work and not be worrying about bringing the virus back home than coming in the office um, and, and worrying about it all day long. So um, yeah, overwhelmingly though, uh, people are, People are doing well when they get back. Yeah, it, it sounds like communication truly is the key and, and over communicating. Uh, at Red Level, we we also did an anonymous survey and uh, we're continuing to uh, communicate status changes that we were getting uh, again from, from the uh, governor. And uh, that was one thing that we got back in our own internal survey was that they appreciated the continual communication, the efforts that we were making. So I think I think that's a pretty pretty common sentiment that communicate you know over communicate as much as possible. And and Andrew, I assume that that was a sentiment for Franklin as well. Or or what, how have things gone since you've returned? Or we really never really left. It thing it you know it's been a constant transition of you know from the early days to where we are now with you know a lot of the employees they see that the the measures that we took place that have taken place with. I think social distancing and just you know a lot of floor marking to for people to understand where to queue and where to stand to wash your hands all of our you know for like our wash up area versus like the bathrooms everything in our whole facility now is all touchless for soap paper towel you know in before that a lot of you know our doors we have a number of doors that we had going between um, in and out of the plant stuff. We actually took the doorknobs off and just put push plates on them and eliminated the so people can just use their arm to push the door open and not have to use their hands to try and streamline some of these things to just eliminate touching on some of those things. But I think all those little steps communicate to the employees that this is serious and that management takes this serious and that their actions demonstrate that. And that's the feedback that we've gotten from people is they, they see these things they're appreciative of them and understand that this is serious and everybody's in this together and we all have to work together to make this work because if we all don't work together it won't be successful and it's not to say with the you know the biggest feedback is the mask is a common message here is they're hot and we don't like them mm -hmm. and we have the option of face shields or if someone has a medical condition that they have to do something else we have alternate PPE for them to wear but you know we when it's quite warm what we've done is we designated with charting certain areas outside where one person only one person can go there but they can take a break go outside then take their mask off get some fresh air breeze come back in because we and we found that to be productive because allowing people to take their mask off on the production floor to because they need a break will lead to everyone on the production floor will have their mask off eventually very quickly because so we have just have zero exceptions to the rule that's the only way that this thing works in the production area and in the office um every you know unless you're in an in an office or a cubicle by yourself not interacting with anyone then you can have your mask off as soon as you need to talk to someone or they come to your office door I put my mask on and we discuss and then even though they're distanced properly away we still wear the mask all the time so, so Andrew, really cool. you're yes. communicating your policies pretty well and, and people are adhering to them and and despite the the, the mask uh, again common theme uh people are are pretty much all in and supportive of of the organization and doing all the things that they need to do so you really haven't seen a, a shutdown of, of any sort but the business itself has been doing well and uh, the employees are bought into to all working together. Yes, we, we've had good buy in with people working together. And, you know, I think as they see schedules improving and, you know, production volumes increasing, I think that, you know, that's helping people understand we've got to stay committed to this. Like this is, you know, the world's not going to end, but we have to adjust. Right. 
And, and Delaney, I assume the same as well, that, that people are pretty um, pretty agreeable to, to work with new, new policies. Um, anything that kind of stands out that since people have come back that, that really you'd like yeah. to share with how, how MMA is handling it? Sure, and actually, I, if it's all right, rather than share the perspective of us as an association, I'd like to share what I've kind of heard from some of our broader ma membership. Please. And while we've heard some, you know, similar concerns as, as what Jennifer and Andrew have expressed about the mass, the frustration there, I think that's just a kind of universal concern that we're having as humans right now. People are frustrated with it. But with manufacturing, um, they are currently the only industry that's required um, by gubernatorial order to take temperatures leading in as part of their screening. Other industries, it's kind of recommended, it's suggested, but manufacturing has to do um, temperatures with touchless thermometers. And I consistently get concerns with members, not about whether to do it or not, it's the inconsistency of the technology um, that a lot of the thermometers out there um, are inconsistent, they're unreliable, you know, within a few seconds they can have wildly vacillating different temperatures. Um, and so that's been kind of, that's been a concern um, a, about, you know, just it's hard enough and it's enough depending on the size of your workforce, getting the screening to happen, you know, you know, like me, uh, Jennifer mentioned, having tents and queue lines and trying to get people to go through, but it clogs up the works even further when your touchless thermometers aren't very accurate and you have to wait, have people wait a few minutes to take the temperature again. Um, we've also heard consistently concerns with cost. You know, everything that's been outlined by, by both of our panelists today, it's a tremendous cost to the organization, whether you're a small organization or a large one, people are putting a lot of money into PPE and engineering controls and switching things in your ventilation. Um, so we are working with the legislature and trying to find ways to offset those costs through tax credits um, and, and try and get some recognition there. I know uh, for those of you that are part of the tax policy committee here at MMA, you might be aware of some work that Treasury is doing to try and recognize this as, um, as industrial processing um, for an exemption, for a tax exemption. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so, uh, so our next question is is about prepping for the future. So this has kind of given a lot of us a chance to, to look inward at the business, uh, really take some reflective actions um, and, and see how the business really is running and make some some pretty major adjustments. Um, for, for example, at Red Level, we, we had a pretty flexible remote work schedule where people could uh, come and go uh, pretty much as needed, but a lot of them still came to the office three, four, and a lot of them four or five days a week. Um, but now uh, we're really conducting the whole business online. Are you know, uh, Jennifer? Are you taking into account for that as you prepare for the future, either a full remote workforce or partial remote workforce? Obviously, with manufacturing, you can't do entirely like that. But but maybe with certain areas. But how how are you preparing for the future based on the things that you've seen so far? So we want to get people back into the office. I think there's a lot of benefit to having people interact and um, <clears throat> just doing that. What I always call drive-by, you know, conversations where you can just stop by and ask somebody a quick question. We implemented at the uh, end of 2019 a remote work policy. So it was kind of, you know, before it really, really needed to be in place. Um, but with COVID, you know, everybody that could work from home did work from home, and the others, when the plants were down, were on furlough. So as we come back. Um, I am hoping and I keep encouraging our managers that we need to allow that flexibility, not it being 100% of the time working from home, but letting people work from home, you know, a couple of days a week. We, we've been able to show the work still got done, if not more, <laughs> um, while people were working from home. But um, yeah, we, we need to give them that flexibility because I think that that's going to help us retain people um, in the future and, uh, and just respect them for you know for getting their work done um and and not have to make it be so old-fashioned where you have to have that button chair for a certain number of hours <laughs> yeah. i would agree and are you taking into that preparation maybe budget changes for the future for as you start to look at you know how the rest of the year is going to go based on things that you may have to continue with these operations are you preparing uh Eludine in that way from from an hr perspective well I mean, we've done some changes this year uh, because of the, the crisis and everything. We're actually, we've announced we're closing one of our facilities um, in New York. Um, so, you know, we're, we're taking more action as far as optimizing footprint within our current uh, facilities. Um, so negative uh, for our employees, but 
in New York, but positive for the organization overall, because again, we're, we're more optimizing of that footprint. Um, as far as office space and things like that go, we're not looking at making any changes um, to what we have right now. Okay. Yeah, that's been a conversation about uh, balancing the office space need. And, and I know a lot of my colleagues have said, you know, they're, they're looking at some kind of workplace balance of, of office space, but, but a lot, still a little early. Um, for, uh, Andrew, any changes that you're preparing for the future right now? Yes, we're, we're looking to probably have more people, you know, as was noted, do more remote work from home and things like that. I mean, myself as one of the owners, I, I work from home all the time because my day is uh, quite long. So it starts early and ends late because you're getting emails and things that to be dealt with that you know, other employees don't see those things. They just see the, e you know, they don't get the emails at 11 o'clock from, you know, key customers that I support in Europe and Asia and stuff like that. They, they kind of get all that filtered down during normal hours. But uh, we're going to have more people work remotely or part of their week, as was noted, because their our productivity has been very high with the six people that I have working remotely. They're getting, I would argue, more done in probably less time and you know their their work personal life balance is a lot better although you know but i think they still want to come into the office for a couple days a week because I, they do want to get out of the house i think that there's a bit of a they like the flexibility but if they could you know work you know one or two days that way and then you know and then be in the office the other time or split their time between home and office or something i don't know we're trying to find that balance with each employee so we can, because we have a smaller set of people, we can kind of tailor things more cookie cutter to their situation to make everybody, to make it work. Because we're going to invest more in, you know, in IT because, you know, our goal is to, I want to get more of our, uh, we've been transitioning all of our data in our um, ERP system to the cloud. And as we do that, that will afford more remote working for other positions. And we're trying to look at that so we can transition. Just, you know, we're not going to reduce, we're not going to, it's not really going to change our footprint at all. It's just going to look at how we have less staff, non essential staff on site, because I don't see, you know, we're going to be in this for, you know, a while and it's not going to go away tomorrow. And we need to look at these decisions for the long view to understand how we can strategically change how we do business to minimize risk on site. So Andrew, you've taken the opportunity to, to really look at your, your own internal technology and make some adjustments and enhancements uh, to, to Franklin. So things that you may not have had the time possibly before, but to really understand how that is that preparing you for the future. Would you say that's that's on target? Yes, yes. It, it, it's been very introspective to look at, okay, where is our IT today and where do we want to take it to so we can really, you know, reduce our total cost of ownership and how we can improve our, you know, our overall effectiveness for our workforce. Great. Thank you. Delaney, what have you heard from the members on how they're preparing? Well, you know, I've, I've heard things along the line of what um, Andrew and Jennifer had mentioned about ongoing remote work, trying to figure out how to make that work, um, greater investment in IT. But there's there's the struggle of how to um, manage your sales, actually how to um, business development in the new normal, um, especially for um, if you've got a sales force that was really heavily reliant on in-person sales. How do you create and nurture those relationships um, in a virtual world? It's much more challenging. I've heard that their um, customers don't want them knocking on the door and visiting. We know that the orders also um, discourage uh, non-essential visitors, and then it leaves it up to you to determine who is essential and who is not. Um, but it's a challenge. So we've got a lot of our members that are looking for um, and, and putting greater emphasis on marketing and trying to get inventive with um, with a new way to approach sales. I, I would I would tend to agree. Um, we're seeing that as well. Um, how about Jennifer? Have you seen much in the area of business development um, that that there's some shift in that to kind of adjust for how sales are being uh, sales are getting done? Not so much. I mean, yeah, there's not the the 
um, on site visits. So it's relying a lot more on on telephone calls, you know, between the the customer and and ourselves. Um, and it, yeah, I know it's going to impact <laughs> when they don't allow visitors in, you know, and uh, and even the screening they're doing with their visitors, um, which is good. We need to. Um, yeah, I think I think as time goes on, um, we're going to see see more of that shift to be of uh, the virtual salespeople as opposed to the face to face. Right. And, and Andrew, you're doing your business development and sales meetings over Teams now. Is that correct? Yes, we use Teams with a number of our customers, or we use Zoom, depending on could be WebEx. It just depends on the size of the customer. They may have their own IT protocols. We have to use theirs versus ours. Some of them do have Teams, so it works out fairly seamlessly. But we're running multiple, you know, online meeting protocols to deal with this and. We do a lot of collaboration online because we have several of our customers that are, you know, they have, uh, you know, and they might have an engineering center in Detroit. They have other, you know, their corporate people on the West Coast and then a parent company in Germany and we have to coordinate all. So we've been doing this for a number of years on this and now I see this as there's going to be, we're, we're just going to have much, much less in person in general. I think the difficulty will be and some of our smaller customers and smaller companies, how to connect with them to maintain that sales touch. And then how is that going to work with like my sales reps that are in the field so that they can refocus how they keep their contact with their, you know, with their base within their territory to stay on top of this. And that's, you know, that's going to have its challenges. And I, I don't know that there's any, uh, when I say I, there's no magic bullets and good answers on that right now, it's like it's kind of a we're just going to have to figure it out as we go to understand every client will be different on what is acceptable as far as contact and where they are in an IT technology perspective to understand how we can interact with them. Because I see that as a big challenge with smaller companies that we call on. They don't have the IT wherewithal. You're going to be doing phone calls all the time. That's probably the main thing. And then graduating to something bigger and better is going to be challenging for my salespeople. I can imagine. So you may, might have even had to implement some training for your team uh, regarding the, the not just you know the way that they do, not just the, what they're doing, but the way that they're doing it, and giving them the resources to be able to do that um, today. Yes, it's it's going to be like a new normal. Absolutely. So. Um, anyone that knows me knows that know that I, I like to use the term win win a lot um, because there's I think you can always find something positive in in uh, even in the worst situations. And in, in given what we have today, um, there are some positives and, and I've seen it with uh, with some people I've seen it with personnel growth. I've seen it with human interaction and, and how people are treating each other. But with respect to your businesses, Jennifer, what can you talk about one positive outcome that's that Aludine has seen or you've seen personally that you can maybe share a story around a, a personal connection at work or you know share something that that you've seen that was surely wouldn't have happened uh, despite without COVID? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I think of just of our HR team here in the U.S. Um, we had daily calls just talking about this and what was going on at each of the different locations. So I think this has really helped the plants know that they can talk to each other. <laughs> I think at times in the past here, you know, they were always their, their own islands, um, figuring out their own problems and the solutions to those problems. Um, but here we came together and worked together and it was this big, big unknown. You know, nobody had gone through a pandemic before, at least not on the team I'm working on. Um, so trying to figure it all out, learn it. And now we can look back and we've got people back to work. It's working well. Um, and I think it's just really energized people. And, and you know, they learned a lot and it's, Brought them closer together as that team, and I could say the same thing for our ops teams as um, safety teams. You know, just really coming together, being very supportive. You know, leaving the negativity at the door. Um, I, I would tell them all the time: we have to be kind to one another. It's very easy to criticize what decision we made yesterday when new information comes out the next day. So, you know, people have been being kind to one another, um, knowing that the information is continually changing. Um, you know, being a lot more flexible um, and and overall just, yeah, I think a little bit more energized in the workforce and, and really coming together and working together, which has been been a very nice positive. You've also probably gotten to see uh, some of your coworkers and colleagues where they live. 
and the kids and, and, the, and the dogs. So you've probably gotten to know them a little bit more in the process, even even with some of uh, the clients as well and, and the, you know, the people that you work with. So um, just before, Andrew, before I get to you, just a quick reminder that we are going to be taking questions in just a couple minutes. So if you uh, know there's a couple questions in the uh, in the chat window, so we're, we're going to get to those in just a minute. But uh, Andrew, um, tell us maybe something positive that, that you've seen at uh, Franklin. I, I think it's it kind of parallels the previous statement that our teamwork has improved dramatically with people at the facility working remotely. It's greatly improved how people collaborate, how they communicate, and, and I mean just general communication skills of using the technology in more concise manner to just because time is of the essence and when you're not there there's not that second opportunity to go back and say oh by the way there's this thing too we're having the meeting our meetings have been more structured and more productive because we have more of a fixed barriers on them with time and people have to do things and you know there's other teams meetings and other that are happening back to back to back so you have definite hard outs then it just it's forced people to be communicate better and work well together. And I and I think it's it's also brought everybody in much closer together to understand that we're in this together. And it's not I, I see it with my shop versus the office people. We don't it's we've got less of the us and them and we're more in this together. And it's like we're all living the same problems every day and the same new circumstances that are presented to us. And we just have to understand that we're all in together and we all have to deal with it together because it, there's just, it's not, we don't have any control. So we just have to kind of understand we have to roll with the punches together on this thing. Yeah, thank you. And Delaney, I'm sure you hear quite a bit from the, um, from the, from the members about a lot of the impacts and how it's, uh, it's causing them to struggle. Um, have you heard a, a story that's that's maybe touched you or changed you or, or touched the MMA at all? Yeah, we've heard lots of fantastic stories and we've experienced that here with our workforce of working together, similar to what uh, Jennifer and Andrew said. But something that to me is, is a reason for optimism going forward is the diversification of product line and manufacturing, whether that's out of necessity because of the supply chain interruptions or to produce PPE, whether they see it's an opportunity or they want to contribute to their community, um, whether they needed it themselves. Um, I think we've got a lot of inspiring stories where manufacturers retool to be able to produce things that were desperately needed. And like I said, it's a reason for um, optimism for our economic recovery moving forward. Wow, that's great. Um, well, we've reached the 45 minute mark. And again, thank you to our, our panelists, um, Jennifer and Andrew and Delaney for, for also helping out. Um, with that, we're going to turn it over to Delaney and get started with some of the questions and hopefully we have enough time to, to cover everyone's. Sure, absolutely. We got some great questions here and I would encourage you all to keep submitting them. We've got, hopefully we'll have some time to, to address them all. And if not, we'll get back with you later. But we've got several questions that relate to the frustration um, that employees are experiencing with masks. Mm -hmm. And they're asking Jennifer and Andrew how you're handling individuals with medical issues who cannot wear masks. And then secondly, how you're handling if an employee just flat out refuses to wear it. Uh, for us, if we have somebody with a medical issue with the mask, you know, they have the face shield that they can wear instead of the mask. Um, so giving people that option a lot of times I think helps, you know, um, so it's either the mask or the face shield. If they refuse to wear it, it's a safety protocol for us. And uh, for us, I mean, safety is is an, an, a non-negotiable. So if somebody's not willing to, you know, follow our safety protocol, they can't work for us anymore. So luckily we haven't had that kind of situation come up, but if we had somebody that would completely out refuse, they're not gonna wear a mask, we don't have any other reason other than I don't want to, well then they're gonna have to find employment somewhere else. Andrew, yes, how are you guys would, handling those issues? Yeah, we, the, basically the same as, as Jennifer's handled it. You know, we, we have face shields, we have masks, we have different types of masks. We've just, I've just ordered uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, masks that have our logo on them for people just to try and, you know, different types. We've experimented with it. Um, but at the end of the day, they have to wear the mask. And if they can't adhere to that policy, 
then they're not going to be an employee of ours anymore. It's pretty it's pretty cut and dried. It's like the the adjustment period is over and it's required. And you know, if you can't follow the rules, then you're going to have to seek employment somewhere else because we're it's the, the safety of everyone at the facility and their families is of the utmost importance. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Now, the, the question that was submitted, I'm not entirely sure which way the where, way they mean it, but I think it can be taken two ways. They're asking about quality issues. So I'm interested to hear if you've had quality issues, you know, with, with everyone trying to do their best through this, these really trying times. Are you experiencing quality issues and challenges within your own team and with the supply that's coming in um, towards your um, towards your facility? Are you seeing some um, quality issues there? And from my point of view, I haven't um, heard of any issues like that. Um, so that to me means we're not. I mean, there's always issues here and there that you always have to work through, um, but no, no real issues. I think the supply chain itself, sometimes having problems getting that supply of material coming in has been a challenge, but I haven't been hearing about the issues being a challenge. Oh, that's good. With within our within our operation, we haven't really had any issues. We because we did not shut down, we didn't have that start up and get everybody reacquainted with quality again to to deal with. But we really internally have not had problems. We've had a few supply chain issues, more from a from a delivery standpoint than a quality standpoint. The quality hasn't been the problem. It's been availability and you know and lead time and things like that. And that's been challenging and I think it's customers also understanding that when they have an issue and they have whatever inventory glitch and need parts immediately, it's not like it was pre-pandemic where things could get corrected fairly quickly. Now it's like we have lead time and that's going to trickle through the supply chain and there's not a lot of slack right now for um, mistakes at the, you know, at at the OEM level on things where there's inventory glitches because there's just not a lot of slack in the system right now. That's the one thing I see from a quality standpoint. It's not the, as I said, not quality of product, but availability of product is the problem. Gotcha. Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of room before and there certainly isn't now. That's for sure. Thanks. We've got, um, people are wondering if, how you're handling um, outside visitors, vendors. Are you allowing them into your facility? Are you requiring uh, either phone or virtual meetings? Yeah, so we've kept ours down to business critical. For the most part, no visitors are allowed. I mean, we have the outside cleaning companies that come in and we actually have them coming in more frequently than we had before. Um, but everybody else we've said, you know, if you can do the visit over the phone, do it virtually, that's the way you need to do it. Yes, we've done the same thing. It's only essential repair, service, and critical equipment, and normal, you know, normal day-to-day -day functioning things that have to happen with, you know, different services that have to come in. But all those people that come to our facility, they get screened when they when they come to our property. We screen them. So we, you know, we have some regular people that come to do different things but they're being screened all the time. And most of them don't even come inside the building. They just go on property, but we still screen them because we want to know, you know, because they, they may have to interact with somebody outside. We want to know what's going on. So sure. it's kind of other, other non-essential things. It's being handled via telephone or Teams or, you know, Zoom or however it needs to be handled, phone calls. That's really how we're handling it. Great, great, thank you. We've got a question about paid sick leave. Uh, we know that in March, Congress passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, and that uh, applies to employers with 500 and fewer employees. Um, but uh, one of our uh, participants was asking directly of you, Jennifer, that doesn't necessarily, um, the, the mandated requirement doesn't apply to Alludyne, but how are you all handling sick time for those with COVID symptoms or who've, who've had exposure? Yeah, so, so we are not covered under the Families First, but we do have, you know, people that work for us are eligible for FMLA. Um, they also can get short-term disability, but what we did is really relaxed our you know, attendance policy. So if somebody, you know, came into contact, thought they had COVID, um, 
we were just putting them out on on a sick leave um, and covering it under FMLA. So um, being being very flexible and very pro employee um, because we're just we're still just learning what all this is about. And I want to make sure that our, we keep our people safe and, and help support them as much as we can. Andrew, how have you experienced with with paid sick leave? Obviously, FFCRA does apply to your workforce, but I'm guessing you've got other policies and, and they intersect here too. Correct. We 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 have the FFRCA, plus we have additional. Um, um, you know, we just have PTO time for people that can be used for sick, vacation, personal. We don't have sick versus vacation time. It's just one bucket of time off and it gets allocated that way and we actually you know went through at the beginning of the year when this started and in and added um you know days to everybody's um pto bucket just in anticipation because we're having a lot of um flu outages and we really start encouraging people to stay home if you're sick and to encourage that you need to make sure that people get paid when they're not there so we you know, did a cost benefit analysis and added days to people's PTO buckets so that they could be off and get paid. Yeah, I do recall back in February, January, February, there was quite um, an expansive influenza B outbreak even prior to this. Um, and, and I think this might, uh, with the answers that you both provided, it seems to me to point back to what you were saying earlier, um, letting employees know, you know, have more confidence in their employers and know that you really are looking out for their best interests, doing a lot of things to keep them safe and to make sure that they have what they need uh, moving forward and that you're concerned about their health. I think that's, you know, we're seeing that with a lot of manufacturers across the state. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And, and it's a, it, it um, gets to raw and finished good materials. And the individual is asking if you are more so looking to onshore raw or finished uh, goods materials, are you doing that? Are you, are you more likely to do that now than before the pandemic? Is that something that's on your radar? Not on mine. Um. And I haven't heard of any changes that we're making within our organization. Um, part of well, sometimes some of our supplies are, are dictated to us by our customer as well as for what mm -hmm. we put into it. But um, yeah, I, I none, none, none that I'm aware of. So <laughs> sorry, okay. I can't give any much more than that. Thank you, Jennifer. Anything on your end, Andrew, that you're you're looking no. at? On no, not really. I don't think there'll be any changes in where we source. Um, as Jennifer stated, we have customer requirements that uh, dictate um, where things have to be sourced. And we also then have regulatory requirements with things because of our aerospace certification. And there are certain regulatory requirements that dictate a uh, country of origin on mm. certain things. And because of that, we're really bound by those things and it doesn't, and those don't afford you a lot of flexibility. Sure, and USMTA, I believe, goes into effect tomorrow. And, and that also has a country of origin requirements too. So getting things a little bit more complicated there. So I think we've got about five minutes left. So David, if you're all right with it, shall we So shall we switch towards the closing? Um, absolutely, absolutely. And again, thanks Delaney for fielding those calls. Um, with that, I think we're gonna, again, thank Jennifer and thank Andrew for your time today and your investment. We did some prep work earlier this week and last week. so. Thank you for taking busy time out of your, your busy schedules and uh, away from your business to really uh, share your experiences with, uh, with our community. Uh, we appreciate all of that and we look forward to staying in touch. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions, they can reach out to, uh, to Red Level Direct. We love to uh, assist. We, we produce the uh, ClearPass app, so it's helping a lot of businesses get back to work. The app is free. So there's no, no cost or charge for that app, but if you're still looking for a way to track and manage um, that solution or getting folks back in the office, um, it, take a look at it. Again, there's no cost and obviously no obligation, but just a way to help other people do that. And uh, we'll follow up with any questions that come in after the, um, after the conference call or after the webinar here and uh, follow up. So again, I wanna say a special thanks to uh, Megan Testani and Christy Masoian for on the Red Level team for organizing this live event and putting it together. And again, special thanks to um, Delaney for the Michigan Manufacturers Association for having us here. And, and again, our panelists, uh, Jennifer and Andrew. So with that, 
Uh, we'll wrap up, give you guys a couple extra minutes in your day, and thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to staying in touch.